to me today. You know, you never know. I give myself lots of time to be her and uh, to get her on time. And the parking lot where, where I work, they're doing some sort of reno. So I got boxed in in a way that they couldn't find, figure out how to let me out. It was like a, a puzzle for them. The guys were running around with the keys. It's like that Seinfeld episode where they can find the keys. To... So anyway, I made it. So uh, we've got lots of time. This is really hopefully interactive. And um, you know, I, I, I encourage you to interrupt me uh, whenever you want. Uh, I have a bunch of cases we can go through. I'd like to get a sense of who's participating and what your background is and you know give me a sense of what your learning needs are and, and sort of what things to focus on. So uh, let me just shout out, uh, what do you do? <laughs> I'm a retired psychotherapist. I'm a member of the um, Academy for Lo Lifelong Learning at the University of Toronto, right. which is uh, an extension department for seniors. Right. And so, and we I'm, in talk later. Of, I'm in the age group um, of which are experiencing this, and I want to be more aware of. More aware, okay. Uh, what other kinds of people, do, what, what do you do? Um, I'm a PhD student at Faculty of Information, and I'm in the collaborative program with the Institute for Life Course and Aging. Okay, who else do we have here? Uh, I'm a new uh, MSW or Master's of Social Work graduate, and uh, specialization in gerontology and interested in dementia. And I'm Jacqueline Smith, and I work in community for social science. Right, okay. okay. I'm a master's student at uh, York University, looking at uh, reconceptualizing built environments, institutional environments, okay. as it pertains to dementia patients, embodiment, and interesting phenomena. Right. I'm a postdoc at Toronto Rehab. On a rehab. Hi. I'll um, let you get settled. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Lynn Howard. I'm at the Faculty of Information. I'm a liaison to this uh, institute and I'm currently working on a research project on um, artifact handling and uh, Aboriginal seniors. Uh, Ron Grosha, retired from uh, Sunnybrook from the University of Toronto, and I'm on the board of directors of uh, Kane Central and Northern Etobicoke Home Support Services. Okay. Neil Houston, nursing with a particular interest in gerontological nursing. All right. Uh, my name is Brian Grant. I'm a social worker at Belmont House for a long-term care retirement home, and also an MSW student at the University of Toronto. Okay. Um, I'm Janet. I am a social worker with a small community agency, and I provide support to caregivers and to my family about mm -hmm. dementia and other aging-related diseases. The, the more helpful it is. And you, sir? I'm not at all. I'm in the arts, and actually, I, I volunteer with people, uh, elderly people, and I'm kind of curious about how to learn more. So on. Okay, one last person. I'm Peggy Zamet, and I'm a graduate of the master's program here, and I just retired from health care for a Still doing research, though, so I have my hand in. Okay, so thanks. I mean, that's really helpful for me to know. Uh, this is a really a uh, a wide array of, of people from different disciplines. Um, so um, I'll try and keep the the talk broad enough. Uh, I want it to be uh, helpful for you, and uh, you'll take away from it various things. And uh, well, we can interact and talk, and you can fire questions at me along the way and at the end. So um, Baycrest is a. Uh, it's a fully affiliated uh, Academic Health Sciences Center with the University of Toronto. We're on Bathurst Street, just south of the 401. And uh, I'm the uh, head of psychiatry there. And uh, I'm one of the uh, psychiatry consultants for the Behavioral Support Units as part of the BSO initiative, Behavioral Supports Ontario. But we do a lot of behavioral, see a lot of behavioral disturbances of dementia throughout the nursing home. So it's a uh, significant interest. We have trainees who come to us and uh, from various dis disciplines. So the learning objectives, well, my objectives for you. <laughs> You'll, you know, you can tell me what you think the objectives should be. But I want you to be able to describe some of the problems, some of the ph pharmacological interventions for, for the uh, symptoms, but some of, what, what some of the problems are with that. So you can get a sense of why medications are not the cure and really to be able to learn and to describe non-pharmacological, so non-medicine ways to, uh, to manage these behavioral symptoms. So we'll do this uh, outline. Uh, what is 
BPSD and causes pharmacological and non-pharmacological then abided in some cases as well and I'm sure other cases will come to my mind as we go. So behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, that's BPSD. Um, people might know, might know this as uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia or behavioral disturbance. It's a, a term that's a catch bag. It, it, it's really describing anything behavioral that's going on with someone with dementia that's not you know, memory loss or cognitive, okay? So again, um, when we talk about dementia, most people think about Alzheimer's disease, that's still the most common form of dementia. There's many forms of dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, Parkinson's dementia, dementia from strokes or vascular dementia, Huntington's, HIV, there's all these other dementias that you can get. The most common is Alzheimer's, and probably Alzheimer's mixed with cerebrovascular disease in the brain. So blood vessel disease in the brain, micro strokes along with, so you do an autopsy of someone's brain they usually have mixed pathology. So, and what happens is, people with, with dementia, you know, you've heard of it, you may have seen it in people you know, family members, you see it on TV, commercials, TV shows. Uh, memory loss tends to be the thing that people think about the most, right? There's a commercial with the man coming home, brings home another orange, he puts it on the windowsill, has a full of oranges. Memory loss is, is, is one symptom of, the, of dementia. But there's all, all, this other, all these other symptoms that are incredibly important and difficult to treat. And they're behavioral and psychiatric. So delusions, for example. Delusions are fixed false beliefs that are not within one's culture. So like example, persecutory or paranoid delusions. They're out to get me. They're tapping my phone. There's bugs in the, you know, my home. That sort of thing, delusions. So, Often it could be delusions of infidelity to a spouse, uh, delusions about one's uh, who who one is. Uh, so all sorts of all sorts of I guess uh, beliefs that aren't true. So that's a symptom of psychosis, right? And hallucinations is another symptom of psychosis. Hallucination is when you experience a sensory experience, right? It's a sensory experience when there's no stimulus. So you see something when there's nothing there. So if we all saw a cow right here. There's no cow, that's a hallucination. So you can have that in various sensory modalities. Um, auditory and visual are probably the most frequent, and in dementia, visual are, are fairly frequent. So those are, the, uh, those are our hallucinations. So delusions and hallucinations are breaks with reality. So that's called psychosis as a term, psychotic symptoms or psychosis. All right? There's lots of other ones, physical aggression. And you'll hear about this. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, X I live at home. Mr. X has uh, Alzheimer's disease and punches wife in the face. Okay, you, you hear these things, so different triggers for that. But physical violence is one of the most difficult things. We've heard of cases you've seen on the news uh, about cases of uh, residents in long-term care getting hurt or killed by other residents in long-term care. Uh, the Casa Verde incident, which was a number of years ago, uh, so deaths as a result of violence. You could have a very someone who is peaceful, uh, very nice person, no criminal record, upstanding citizen, suddenly is violent uh, with dementia, and they say, "That's not my father. I mean, who is that? I can't believe he's doing that." But it's a very significant, uh, difficult symptom. That's everything else. Okay, screaming, yelling, wandering, pacing, disrobing, touching, mm -hmm. crying, uh, hoarding putting things in the mouth that don't belong in the mouth, like uh, inanimate objects, okay? I've heard of a patient dying asphyxiation, put um, a sock in the mouth. It's a hyper-oral behavior that you'd see in Kluver-Busey syndrome or frontal dementias, where there's a hyper-orality, you put things in the mouth. So you actually see people have all sorts of strange behaviors like that. Apathy, probably one of the most common. Apathy is a sort of that loss of motivation and in interest. It's when someone's sort of lying around and has no initiative to do anything, but it's okay with that. They're all right with it. They're not depressed. They just have no get up and, no initiative. Not so you can get up and go. Just don't feel the need to do anything. Would you like to do this? Would you like to do that? No, and again, it's, it's really a frontal lobe function. Sleep disturbance is very common in uh, dementias. There's all sorts of sleep changes in dementias and um, repetitive or compulsive behaviors. 
So I was there yesterday in the nursing home. I saw this patient. The resident was, we were referred to patient. It's kind of an odd case um, because it was very rapid deterioration. But anyway, so we saw this lady and she um, has these vocalizations. It, it, it drove the other persons really like, <laughs> made them angry. And it sounds like this. Oh, 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 oh. Break, maybe 10 seconds, continue. The whole time that she's awake, okay? It's a repetitive, stereo, it's kind of like a stereotype behavior. Actually, it's physical motions. I remember when I started working at Baycrest when I was a student, I had one guy yelling something like that. He's yelling, oi, nonstop, all day. The person next to him had this like, frontal release disinhibition, so was swearing, like swearing like, you know, uh, swearing like, I don't know what, I couldn't even think of more imaginative phrases. And then the person, so you have the person yelling, the person swearing, and the person next to that one had echolalia, just repeats everything that the person hears. So it was quite a, it's quite a theater of sound, so. But it, it's kind of compulsive behavior, stereotype behavior. Very, again, very difficult. So these behaviors are behavioral symptoms of dementia, and there's more, okay, there's more. Can you just go back to aggression for a second? Yeah. Um, my experience is that we deal a lot with physical aggression, but we don't deal a lot with the emotional aggression, where they really go at you aggressively emotionally. I mean, you know, I don't know, is that, is that quote, under aggression? Like, you know, and it's only certain people that they will do it with, all right? And then a certain, another person comes in, another way of talking, whatever it is, and they, and it, and it they, so I always right. find with aggression that we always go to the physical. And yet, I find what is the definition when they emotionally. Um, so here it is. Uh, oh, thank so you. It's okay. You're, 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 you're one step ahead of me. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> so it probably falls onto, under agitation, well, at least for this definition of agitation. Inappropriate verbal, vocal, or motor activity not judged by an outside observer to result directly from apparent needs for confusion. So verbal agitation or verbal aggression is an example. That a kind of verbal. It's not physical, but it's aggressive. It's angry and it's difficult and distressing to the recipient, mm -hmm. who is often the spouse if they live at home. Mm -hmm. By the way, mm -hmm. my husband can hold it together when we're out for a little bit, but when we get home, it's out of control. Mm -hmm. That's that verbal aggression and agitation. Uh, this slide was sort of an attempt to try and show you where where these um, symptoms might come from. We don't really know. So again, what do we know about these diseases? Brain cells die, and depending on which disease you have, which dementia, there's a different order in which things go. But you can imagine, so for psychosis, you know, they, there's some evidence probably frontal or temporal cortex, association areas, limbic, basal ganglia, visual hallucinations perhaps in the visual cortex and downstream association areas. Apathy is probably again frontal, anterior cingulate uh, gyrus. There's some white matter tracts that flow through. So we don't have really have a good idea of the neurochemical and neuroanatomical or physiological changes that would happen. We know about these brains that they shrink, brain cells get destroyed, and um, in various order, various ways. So why are these symptoms important? Because it's actually what's, what drives people into long-term care. So people who live in a residence, let's say they live at home, Mr. and Mrs. X, again, if we say, you know, if, if, the, if Mr. X is the patient and is up all night and is an elopement risk and is tended to wander out and they need to call the police or is violent or is, is, is requiring the kind of care that, that will burn out the caregiver, we know that person will end up in long-term care, the caregiver will burn out. Caregiver burnout is really associated with major depression in the elderly. Rates of depression are very high. So, th so it, it causes a, a whole slew of problems. Quality of life is always impaired, okay, for both. Increased cost of care, emerge visits. Um, the, uh, one of the people in the, the LIN, the Ministry of Health has these LINs, Integrated Health Networks. And I, we, I, said, I said to Camilla Orridge, I said, you know, what can we offer a psychiatrist to you? We wanna help you, we wanna help the government, we wanna help our citizens. And she said, you know, we don't, we, don't, we know that older adults with dementia should not end up in eMERGE because of behavioral disturbances. Because there's not much we can do there for them in eMERGE once they, they've gotten there. 
What do you do? You strap them down and inject them and send them back. It just doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. We need a different intervention. That's why we have all sorts of new money and interventions in, in Ontario, behavioral supports in Ontario. So increased cost of care, all these, all these eMERGE visits, rapid cognitive decline, lots of caregiver burden, nursing home placement. Um, it's hard to investigate people with dementia. We have some patients we can't get a blood pressure. Right? I say, check the blood pressure, the person's falling. We can't even get a blood pressure. The person hits or strikes out or is uh, reluctant and resistant. And then uh, staff, staff mm -hmm. or caregiver um, burnout and turnover. So, you know, you have to have consistent caregivers. They know the person the best, but if the person's getting hit all the time, imagine going to work and being hit every day. Mm -hmm. Imagine that was your job. You're going to go, you're going to take care of someone, but there's a 99% chance you're going to get hit, scratched, bit, or spat on. Would any of us want that job? It's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine why people would sort of want to change your profession, right? Mm -hmm. Change, uh, I'll take a different client. Thank mm -hmm. you. It's very common. Some studies will say up to 90% of people with dementia will have behavioral symptoms at some point. Again, there's a range, ranging from apathy to full-out aggression and homicide. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so there'll be a range. Where mm -hmm. It's a, much more frequent to have sort of the more mild behaviors. It's more infrequent to have something like homicide, obviously. That's a very infrequent, so it's like a triangle or a pyramid. Okay, so we'll talk a bit about causes or models of why people would get this. So one model is unmet needs. I don't know how many of you have children. I have some children. So, or if you've been around babies or, <laughs> you know, how do you know what their needs are? You don't, right? You know that they're crying. Okay, what does that mean? So what do you do? Check the diaper, try and stimulate, stimulate them, and try and maybe feed them. You're trying to guess what the needs are. That's part of what happens in, in a dementia population where there's behaviors where you think there might be an un, unmet need all right, that can't be communicated properly. So someone can't communicate what's bothering them or what they need, so they act out in some way. The behavior is the expression of, of the need, whether it be something like hunger or thirst. You know, this lady that I said was calling out and was making those noises continuously all day. Uh, we gave her some water. She drank like a liter of water. She was thirsty, you know. Was, you know so we're just trying different things. What's the need that's being unmet here? So that's one model. You know, so think about that. Progressively lowered stress threshold model. So what that is, um, is that we all have this threshold at which point, you know, we can handle stress to a certain point. Beyond that, we might have some sort of behavior. We all have that, right? Mm -hmm. our, our thresholds are probably pretty high. Mine's pretty high to a point. Someone with dementia probably has a lower threshold for the stress. And there's lots of demands put on someone with cognitive impairment that maybe they can't deal with. So there might be too much demands and their threshold is lower. A person may know, not know what they are, where they are, what they want, what's being asked of them. The demands might be too much and then you might see behavioral symptoms. So that's another theory. Then there's this ABC theory, which is a learning theory. Uh, I'll show you examples of a learning theory a bit later on. But the, if any of you have taken you know, psychology courses, we know that we could reinforce certain behaviors so that they happen more frequently. We could try and use extinction to get rid of behaviors that we don't want a lot. And then there's other things like you know, punishment and negative reinforcement, which we don't use too much, obviously. But, but we know that there are certain principles, and we look at antecedents of the behavior and the consequences to try and figure out what the triggers are and how staff maintain or their caregiver may maintain the behavior or make it worse. In Ontario we call behavioral symptoms of dementia, the new term is responsive behaviors, meaning that the person is responding to something else mm -hmm. and that you know there's uh, lots of factors involved, not just the, not only the, the person's internal psychic um, problems. Any questions up till now? Okay, I'm almost done. Okay. We'll keep going. Feel free to interrupt at any time. Right. So the first step is a good assessment. You have this person, and again, you you might have theories about what's going on. Uh, in medicine, we try and rule out things. Someone comes in, says, "I have chest pain." You think, "Well, it sounds like heartburn." What you'll try and do is disprove that. If you're an emergency doctor. You try and disprove your theory. It's the basis of medicine. It's called the differential diagnosis. Here's five or six things that it could be, 
I'm going to rule out the things that, you know, I'm going to do a process of elimination. So, you know, it's heartburn. You probably should do a cardiogram and make sure it's not a heart attack, right? Or it could be pulmonary embolism. So, I mean, there's different... So, same thing with someone who has dementia. You think, well, this might, this must be due to I have a man with a, a hernia. So, he seems to be in discomfort from the hernia. There's other reasons why he might be so aggressive. So, a good assessment is really what's needed. It's multidisciplinary, usually. You need different sources of information. If you sit down with someone with dementia, they'll tell you in the moment, because they live in the moment often, right, what bothers them, okay? So that doesn't give you that much information. They give you some information. They can tell you if they're sad or angry or if there's some sort of delusional belief, some sort of paranoia or hallucination. They might be able to express that to you, but really you're going to be speaking to the caregiver or caregivers, uh, and that's really the, the cornerstone of the assessment. If someone, you know, we like to look at old notes, old charts, old reports, speak to the caregiver, the family, the, the staff, CCAC, whoever's coming in, whoever knows that the person. Try and get to know who they are, what their personality was like, what were their hobbies, what were their interests, what was their occupation. It's really important. I saw, I went to Sheridan Villa, which is in Mississauga, and we went to see this, they had a behavioral uh, unit there, and we were going to create one at Baycrest as well. And we wanted to see how they did things. They told us about this case of this woman who was really very agitated every morning. And they don't know what to do. They gave her medication. They did this. They did that. But not, nothing was working. Until somebody figured out, found out eventually by speaking to a family member, that the person used to go for a long jog every morning. The person was a runner. So I don't know how many of you are runners, but apparently it's addictive. Right? You like running. You get used to running. This lady was a runner. So they found a way to get her to run every day. And there's this little garden outside with this uh, sort of, uh, I guess, like a, not a fountain, but a bunch of plants. There's this big circle. So just she just ran around. It wasn't very long, but it was maybe half the size of this room. And she ran. They brought her the running shoes, and she ran. Problem solved. No antipsychotics, no anticonvulsants, no injections, no emergency visits. So that worked really well, right? It's kind of an interesting... So knowing more about the person is very, very important. Um, and an adequate physical exam, blood work, checking. You know, a lot of people haven't had a good examination in a while. One of my first patients, um, I was in Sunnybrook, and they brought in a man to the acute uh, psychiatric unit and was in the ICU because he was so aggressive and violent and screaming. But he had, the, the bottom line is he had dental problems. He had, horrible dental problem. He brushed his teeth and I don't know how long. The treatment was to take out his teeth and, and to let it heal. And, you know, give him uh, you know, softer food or whatever. I mean, that worked properly. Problem solved. But, so, you really have to think broadly about things. So, really doing a proper physical exam and, and yeah, proper blood work to rule out medical causes is important. The whole thing about urine is a bit sketchy. We're not sure. You know, right now, we're trying not to use antibiotics on everybody who shows up with um, white blood cells in the urine. So if you're an older person with dementia, okay, an older person in general, but if you have dementia in particular, and they find um, bacteria in the urine, it's meaningless. That's kind of normal. If you just took a bunch of people and checked their urine, they're going to have bacteria in the urine. So you wouldn't treat that. It's called bacteria, bacteria in the urine. Uh, it becomes more of a problem if the person actually has symptoms because we know that these organisms are becoming resistant to anti anti I was antidepressants, <laughs> antibiotics. So, um, so uh, urine, I'm not sure. I used to see someone who suddenly became aggressive and like, check the urine. But we stopped doing that unless there's real urinary symptoms, which is hard to figure out if the person's incontinent and can't express themselves. But sometimes something's really foul smelling and cloudy and you, know, you start thinking about it. What are you looking for in the blood? Um, Sorry, what was your question? What, what are they looking for in the blood work? Because I always see they do blood work, but what are you looking for, especially with dementia? Well, I mean, you, you do blood work for two reasons. One is uh, you always look for reversible causes of dementia. Yeah. Right, so that, that's the one part. Yeah. And the main guidelines will tell you to do a blood count, electrolytes, glucose, calcium, thyroid, and add mm -hmm. somatoglobins like B12 and folate mm -hmm. if uh, required. And then um, if you suspect that there's something medical, you know, you never know about metabolic disturbance, you never know hyponatremia, hypernatremia, mm -hmm. uh, kidney, um, you know, people have chronic renal failure often, you're just not aware. But it also tells you about how you're gonna dose your, your medications. Okay. Anemia, because yeah. someone's apathetic and not doing anything, yeah. and has no appetite, 
So it, it doesn't hurt to do just a general screen. It doesn't okay. cost a lot. Okay. You don't really get stuff. I mean, that, that's one of the things when, when we do scans and you don't often find something. That's, but sometimes you do. Okay. Especially in the rare cases. Like the cases where you, you sort of don't know what to do. The, assess the assessment really involves looking for triggers if possible. I said these could be responsive behaviors. So why is the person um, acting the way they're acting? Why do they have that behavior? Uh, so for example, I gave you the example of uh, the person who's yelling, then the person who's screaming next to them. You know, well that person is screaming, why? Well, because there's a stimulus that's making them scream. So it's an environmental issue. Um, and understanding the cognitive impairment, well, understanding someone's abilities or inabilities cognitively. I mean, some people could actually remember. We have one lady who has frontal temporal dementia, so it affects the frontal lobe first. That doesn't have that much to do with memory. It's not like Alzheimer's disease. Memory is actually retained for a while. So helping that person with behaviors would be a little different than somebody else because they could retain information. They might actually know where they are. So these are this is a list of environmental factors that could play into uh, the agitation. So you can imagine the excessive noise or stimulation. I went to the unit the other day with a couple of residents, and it was, it was, it was like Times Square, man. It was like <laughs> people everywhere and loud and wandering and touching, pushing each other. It's like it's not a good place if you're sensitive to, to stimulation. Right, so being around a nursing station or being around places where there's hustle and bustle. You know, my husband has Alzheimer's. I took him to the mall. I took him to York Hill on a Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Maybe not a good place to be if that person's sensitive to noise. That's an extreme example. I don't like being at York Hill Mall at 3 o'clock. <laughs> so that would just, we're eating center, whatever. So lack of structure or routine or oh, understimulation. So for some people, this is one of the biggest problems that, that actually exists. When people have nothing to do, they're not able to do the things they used to do. They can't do the hobbies they used to have. So what, what do they do? They need something to do. So they get agitated. So we give them something to do. Yeah? Um, on that point, I was just wondering about the environmental factors, um, specifically as it pertains to architectural design or interior design that relates to uh, the individual's pathology. Um, so basically, uh, mobility of lighting some, um, based on some of the observations that I've had, where people are gravitating to one light source mm -hmm. where there's nothing uh, within uh, the space at all, or the fact that mobility wasn't promoted because of the fact that they were confined to uh, a, a very small space. Yeah. So I'm wondering, have you seen anything, the reciprocation of environment as it pertains to uh, the home? We all know it's a huge problem. Yeah. And if you go into nursing homes, if you mm -hmm. went and started looking at nursing homes, some nursing homes are a hallway and then you have a dining room and maybe some sort of a rec room of some sort and then you know the nursing station I mean uh, inadequate lighting also uh, too much reflection isn't good certain kinds of lighting is definitely not good I, ideally if you were to build your own place where you say this is going to be a place for people with dementia to live who have behavioral symptoms you'd want it to be like a playground for adults basically uh, places to roam around, places to walk, places to run, jog, things to do, things to play with, touch, uh, things, a place where you could be quiet, <laughs> places where you could be stimulated. It's called mm -hmm. snoozling, for example. I'll tell you more about that. And that would be, be sort of the ideal environment. Like even our place, it's really not great. We have a horseshoe, and we can't see around the corner too well. And some people are off in a distance, and we want to, you know, Kind of isolated, and we have everybody packed into this one area where the staff are. So, you know, if you're actually designing a place, you, you think about it very differently about what the ideal would be. I think there should be separate floors for people who are up all night and mm -hmm. for people who are up all day. Because mm -hmm. the people who are up all night, um, it ends up causing a lot of disturbance. Mm -hmm. Nothing causes the administration more aggravation than, like, we know the patient isn't dangerous, but they're going to everybody's room mm -hmm. and they bother them. They wake the, you know, and then everybody starts calling the family members, or patients who lie down in other people's beds because they're wandering at night. It's like, so you know, we should have two floors day and night. So the structure is very important, but we're sort of stuck with the structures we have. Uh, inadequate lighting. I wrote about um, confusing surroundings, excessive demands placed on them. So again, 
uh, too much demands. We can't expect certain people to do certain things. Again, it's like asking your you know, two-year-old to tie their shoes. Mm -hmm. They can't, right? Uh, loneliness, boredom, and the behavior of others. Medical conditions. Again, just some medical conditions. Of dehydration, constipation. Mm -hmm. The first thing I do is I like to ask if the person's actually having bowel movements. <laughs> because for some reason, uh, people with uh, dementia, uh, well, again, first of all, there's eating habits. So if someone has a lack of appetite, you might see if they're constipated. But if you're constipated for more than a few days, I mean, you feel terrible. And so how are they going to express that, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes we'll look, I'll look at a chart, chart it and see, well, the person hasn't had a bowel movement in four or five days. It's like, my God, like, the person's uncomfortable. They need a fleet enema. They need something. So um, the, some of the easiest and biggest successes and that I'm most proud of is by looking at the stool chart and saying, this person needs a laxative. Mm -hmm. You know, problem solved. Mm -hmm. Bowel regimen. Um, various types of infections. I told you about dental pain. Any kind of pain. There's a good study I'll tell you about uh, uh, regarding pain, but you can imagine, you know, we've all had pain at some point. Imagine you have a bad back, you can't really express it, and your back hurts you, and you're trying to tell people, you might hold your, your back, but how do you advocate for yourself? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what that would be like. Okay, here's a study for the pain protocol. Because, you know, sometimes you go to a, a, see somebody and they're on 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol four times a day, which would be sort of reasonable. Uh, three to four grams a day you could give for someone who's in chronic, chronic pain, depending on their, their age. Um, this study just said, well, let, let's keep at it. We'll take all comers with behaviors, regardless of what kind of behaviors, regardless of whether or not we think they have pain, and we're gonna treat them as if they have pain, based on the behaviors. And they went to acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, and if that didn't work well, they went to morphine. And if that didn't work well, they went to the morphine patch, fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And if that didn't go well, they went to pre pregabalin, which is uh, Lyrica. So they went through this process, and they had good results. <laughs> they had good results. So maybe there's unmet needs here. And so you know, they, they looked at the agitation. They didn't look at people who are physically aggressive. They had a significant reduction in behavioral mm -hmm. symptoms. So I just thought it's a nice study that sort of demonstrates that we have to think physical. If you look at that pieces model, there's a pieces model that we've mm -hmm. uh, become, it's become popular in Ontario across mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. The first thing is what are the piece for physical, what are the physical issues that might be at play, the physical strengths and, and problems that might be mm -hmm. happening with this person. So often we'll say we suspect there's pain, we have a guy now who has this hernia, and sometimes he really looks like he's in pain, so ventral hernia sticking on the front. So you know, we'll, we'll try medications around the clock. Arthritis. Do we have a question? Yeah. I'm not familiar with the effects of those medications aside from the sedimentary, but is it possible that with administering these painkillers might be masking the actual cause? So, um, I mean, I don't know, say if it's morphine, if the person, if the morphine makes you more calm, that it might not be the fact that there's pain that needs to be alleviated, but that just that you're more sedated. Yeah, are these medications calming? I think these medications are not typically calming, but could be sedating. Right, so the, it could be a compound. A fentanyl patch, again, also, Lyrica, not so much. You know, it's more side effects, more like swelling, uh, you know, weight gain, that sort of thing. Not, not too much in terms of sedation. But. So, you know, it's a fair question about compound. I'd have to look at the study and see if they would have um, measured uh, alertness throughout the day. Most of the studies will take that into account, though. Like the big trazodone study for frontal frontal dementia. You know, I asked them, well, they're just sedating them because trazodone is, so, is a sedating pill. So uh, I'd have to look back at the study to see. But that's a good question. So in terms of pharmacological management, there's a bunch of medications that you might think about using or that would be tempting to use, and these have all been studied. And... Uh, so I don't know to what degree you want me to get into this, and you could tell me, uh, maybe just go like that if you want me to stop. But <laughs> I'll just tell you that we want the magic pill, right? That's, hey, I'm a doctor. I love writing prescriptions, right? Because it's, 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 it's something that, you know, you figure, well, this is, this is something that you can do. It's going to be effective. I'm going to give a medication. It's going to work, you know. For this problem, no. In, in dementia, there's nothing... That, that's going to intervene, like a medication. It's not like you know you treat hypertension with an antihypertensive or 
an infection with an antibiotic that you see, you know, dramatic sort of uh, effects sometimes. Uh, we're looking for that magic pill. Well, even those medications don't, don't necessarily work for everybody. But we're looking for that, that perfect pill that's inexpensive, tolerable, and very effective. We don't have that. The best evidence we have is for the antipsychotics. And so those are medications created for things like schizophrenia, but have wide uses for uh, mood disorders, bipolar disorder, depression, certain other illnesses. So they thought they would try antipsychotics in people with dementia because a lot of the symptoms are you know, hallucinations or delusions, aggression. So they figured, you know, let's try this. And they've done a number of studies. So antipsychotics end up having the best, um, the best evidence. They also have the most problems. Can you talk about the use of antipsychotics with uh, Lewy body? And yeah, I will, for sure, and, and, and just in a second. Could you go back to the previous slide, at yes. least for those of us who are familiar with some of them, but not oh, So yeah, I was going to go through these one at a time. Antidepressants for depression, cholinesterase inhibitors are the anti-dementia drugs, the ones that you would be, probably the, sta the standard of care is to use that for someone who's having Alzheimer's disease to slow down the impairment in cognition and try and preserve functioning. That's an, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Anticonvulsants are anti-epilepsy drugs. Memantine is also um, an anti-dementia drug. Again, doesn't change the course of the illness. People still progress, but it's I've been shown to, again, um, for moderate to severe dementia, be helpful for the cognitive impairment. Prazosin is, uh, is uh, something that is used for me medical conditions, um, affects uh, blood pressure to a certain degree, it can be used for prostate, you know, one of those types of medications. So atypical antipsychotics, again, have the best evidence. Canada, um, in Canada, we, risperidone had the indication for behavioral symptoms of dementia. In, uh, in the States, nothing has the indication. The none of the antipsychotics do that. So. Risperidone up to two milligrams, and there's lots of randomized placebo-controlled trials, very good, strong scientific evidence that it works, that's been analyzed in various ways. So again, not massive effects. The effect size is, mo is modest, but is significant. Okay, so when you look at literature, you're looking for significance in terms of how they did the statistics. So that's one of them. Aripiprazole is another, it's relatively new. Uh, it's also called Abilify. Some um, evidence about it, you know, that it could be injectable or oral pills. Olanzapine is Zyprexa. Again, these are all schizophrenia medications. Now with some evidence for uh, behavioral symptoms of, of dementia. Uh, those top three are gonna be um, in the Canadian sort of consensus guidelines for dementia um, as uh, being useful for psychosis and aggression. Not for wandering. If someone's wandering, this medication will not help. If someone's calling out because of boredom, this medication wouldn't help, unless you're sedating them, which is not the goal here. But if someone's aggressive or paranoid or hallucinating, these medications certainly are indicated. Okay? Photiopine is another one, there's mixed evidence. Dementia with Lewy bodies? Who asked me that question? So if you're going to have someone with dementia with Lewy bodies, that's a kind of dementia where Lewy bodies are these little bodies, <laughs> I'd say, that, that are in the brain. You could have those in parts of the brain in Parkinson's disease, okay, and it affects just the part of uh, the brain for Parkinson's disease that, that's responsible for movement. And the dementia of Lewy bodies, they could be in various parts of the brain. So the dementia of Lewy bodies could actually have a lot of that Parkinsonism, Parkinson's like symptoms, and very sensitive to antipsychotics. So if you give someone an antipsychotic, they can become very, very, very rigid and have terrible side effects to that, have all sorts of problems. So for dementia with Lewy bodies, the evidence, um, first line is with rivastigmine or an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, denepazole or rivastigmine. Uh, rivastigmine has a good study. But if those don't work, or if they're on it anyway and they're, and they're still symptomatic, you're going to go with something that doesn't block dopamine too much, probably for typing. And what's the, um, for the hallucinations, Rivastigmine. So this is the way that, that study we use rivastigmine against placebo, and psychosis got better too, the hallucinations, because there's a very bad acetylcholine deficit in that in that illness, and um, an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor slows down the breakdown of acetylcholine, 
So it's going to be helpful in that kind of an illness. Alzheimer's also has an acetylcholine deficit, but it's even worse in Lewy body dementia. So, not a huge amount of research, but there's some at least. So the problem with antipsychotics is that they're potentially dangerous, like problems, certain problems like stroke and death. You know, I'm, I'm being, being kind of you know, facetious about it, but there's, it, it's worrisome, but not worrisome in a way, okay? Because when, when you look at the, the actual numbers, they're quite, they're quite low. So if you tell if you tell someone I want to use an antipsychotic, okay, um, and it it triples your risk of stroke, say, oh, that sounds really scary. I start looking at the numbers; it increases it very marginally. The risk is about one percent. So, so it's not um, if if it, if the medication is indicated and other things have failed, and if the person is very distressed, and you say there's a small risk of stroke, there's a small risk of death. Again, the uh, one in one hundred. So the person would may give you consent, provided that the benefits are outweighing the risks. It's all about this risk-benefit ratio. So if the, if the risks are really bad and, the, and you don't get much benefit, why would you take any medication? And, and, these, and people that really need the medication, you're usually at a point where everybody's agreeing, you know, the risks are, are usually going to be outweighed by the benefits at this point. So, you know, we, we have to be very upfront with people. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a big... Uh, proponent of informed consent. Mm -hmm. um, it, it bothers me when people don't get informed consent. Uh, I want to know if someone's giving me or my family member uh, a treatment or investigation. What are the risks? Or what are the benefits? What are the alternatives? So we have this conversation, this discussion with, uh, with families and substitute decision makers, powers of attorney. But it has to be framed in a certain way. I'd like to give the data transparently. The risks are there, but they're very, very, very small. Okay. And when you look at quality of life, which is what most people are interested in, they'd say, I'm willing to take the gamble, although it's a very small risk. All right, so, so we won't give the medication and put it in the drinking water for everybody with dementia to have because there's a small effect size, it doesn't work for everybody, and there are some risks, although it's small. But for, some, for somebody who's had multiple strokes, you know, you're going to think twice about it. You, know, you want to try something else first. The risk of death is higher with uh, the older antipsychotics. It has other problems. Pneumonia is a big problem. These antipsychotics tend to be connected to uh, devel developing pneumonia, but low blood pressure and then that can result in falls. Uh, metabolic problems like weight gain, uh, more of diabetes is probably the, the biggest one. And some of the Parkinsonism, that's what EPS stands for, extracurandular side effects. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, I told you those are medications that are standard of care for dementia. If a family member or someone you know has dementia, they're probably on one of these medications. And we would like to think that they would work, but the evidence really isn't there. That, you know, when they've done the studies, they're usually post hoc analyses. So they'd look back at the studies that were done for cognition and for memory, and they would look at other measures to see if it improved behavior at all. You know, but that doesn't really stand, uh, that doesn't really uh, uh, pass that, that sort of test for evidence based medicine. What you want is to take people who are agitated with dementia, divide them into two groups. Placebo, which is a nothing pill, versus this kind of pill. When you do that, the results are quite inconsistent. Some good studies are, are negative. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there might be a signal that there's delayed emergence according to some of the post hoc analyses. Most people are on these medications anyway. So, you know, it certainly doesn't come up as a first line uh, for someone who's got very significant symptoms. Except for dementia with Lewy bodies. Okay. Nemantine, again, is one of these anti dementia drugs. Very easy to take, hardly any side effects. We really want it to work. Uh, the studies are negative. Large studies, negative. So it doesn't do anything in terms of behavior. It does for cognition, but not for behavior. Anticonvulsants, there's one called Tegretol, and it's an anti-epilepsy drug. It's helpful for agitation. So, you know, it's kind of bizarre. Why would you think that? But it seems to work. Antidepressants. Well, that seems like it could be helpful, right? And some of the antidepressants are kind of easy to take, and you know, the tolerability issues aren't, aren't too bad. Uh, so citalopram is one, it's called Celexa. So that's a pretty typical antidepressant, you may have heard of it. That antidepressant's been shown to be as good as risperidone, better than placebo, as good as another antipsychotic. So there's a couple of studies, not a lot of studies, doesn't have the amount of evidence that, let's say, the antipsychotics have. Um, Trazodone, there's not really a lot of evidence for it, but we end up using it because it's kind of sedating. 
and so it's helpful for, helpful for sleep. There's only one good study for trazodone, and that's in this, this frontal temporal dementia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I used to be with the RVP. Uh, I'm very insistent on my team um, always trying to stay away from prescribing trazodone because we saw that it became a, our, our patients were at a high risk for falling. Because of hypotension or over sedation. So, I mean, any medication is safe to use as long as you mitigate the risks somehow. So, I use trazodone because you run out of options after a while. <laughs> you do. And you have to start finding creative ways to help people. If you look at sleep disorders in, in, in the elderly and in the nursing home, you don't have a lot of options. Benzodiazepines aren't great, right? Then you've got hypnotics, which don't always do, do the trick. So then what? You know, there's not, not too many things. Melatonin, meh. So you end up using trazodone. You just have to monitor blood pressure. And so you, you just have to be careful. The blood pressure starts, starts to drop, you're in trouble. If you've over sedated the person, the risk of aspirating or falling. So I use it a lot um, because sometimes you run out of other options and sometimes it works. So for frontal temporal dementia, I mean, you just have someone on 300. I mean, you just have to watch with any of these medications. Antipsychotics also cause hypertension, falls. Antidepressants cause falls. Citalopram causes falls in the elderly. Dementia causes falls in the elderly. So again, this is why the job is very hard. So in summary about the medications, the first line agents are atypical antipsychotics for people who have psychosis or aggression. Well, we know what the risks are, but we know that there's some benefit. And then citalopram has some evidence. Second line, probably carbamazepine, because it has a couple of uh, positive studies. And then guidelines will put trazodone up there um, because it could be not too difficult to use as long as you can watch the blood pressure. And it's got evidence for frontal temporal dementia. It's one particular kind of dementia. But you don't jump to the medications right away. So if you look at the treatment guidelines, the Canadian Coalition for Seniors Mental Health, they have treatment guidelines. The treatment guidelines will, will tell you, if the person is at imminent risk of hurting themselves or somebody else, they don't do this nice, long, two-week formative assessment to look at triggers and this and that. The person's at imminent risk of hurting somebody, you're going to treat pharmacologically, and you probably use an, uh, an antipsychotic. And that's in black and white in the 2006 Canadian uh, Coalition Guidelines for uh, Nursing Home Psychiatry. Or, sorry, Nursing Home Care. Non-pharmacological techniques should be used in every other case, at least initially. And even in the people who are very aggressive, you're going to think of what the triggers are and what other interventions you could use, even if you're using a medication. These are just some of them. There's hundreds and hundreds of studies of non-pharmacological techniques. Everything ranging from music, therapeutic touch, aromatherapy, if you want aromatherapy, um, multi-sensory stimulation, token economies to reward good behavior, reminiscence, validation, um, certain special bathing techniques, muscle relaxation, cueing, reinforcement. Snoozeland is that room, multi-sensory room. There's things to smell, see, touch, hear. Uh, so, you know, so it's like a multi-sensory room. So exercise, and there's more. I just put some here. And there's hundreds and hundreds of studies. So you could try reading it, it's a long read. Even the review articles, there's lots of review articles. I'll just go through it quickly to, to show you. that The problems though is that a lot of the studies are quasi-experimental. So for example, there might not be a control group where someone is doing another intervention you know, because attention will give you, as soon as you think you're being studied or if there's some sort of attention, you know, there's that effect. And it's, it's called placebo effect. So you need the control group. So a lot of the uh, studies have small sample sizes. They're not really fully randomized in the proper way or controlled with a placebo um, or don't have enough uh, numbers of people involved to show significant responses. So there's lots of problems with the, the way the studies are designed. And sometimes they're just, just not practical. So imagine, you know, I work in a nursing home. So if someone wants to do a study, and they brought in all these people, and everybody's walking around with clipboards, and there's all these extra therapists and people around to help them do things, and we're going to do this intervention, and there's all these people who are hired by the research assistant, or the research assistant's hired by the researcher. So that's great, and there's a significant improvement, and then they leave, mm -hmm. and then we're stuck there. Mm -hmm. And you're stuck with the same resources you had before, and it, so sometimes you just can't intervene in that way. Sometimes it's just not practical. 
Uh, this good review, it's, it's getting older, right? it's 2005, but Livingston found that psychoeducation, so education to caregivers, and management, behavioral management techniques, which I'll talk about, seem to be effective during the treatment period, music and sensory stimulation. So during the time that they had those, yeah. Do you refer to uh, Sinai's Carers program? Uh, the Reitman Center? Mm -hmm. So for caregivers? When, when, yeah, when, when necessary, when they need to. That's a good program. Um, the Reitman Center's program is, it helps train caregivers, spouses mostly, um, on how to deal with uh, the person in the home with dementia and their behaviors. So it's a training program. It's, it's, psych, it's more than psychoeducation, it's real training. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's a simulation. I had uh, a patient and uh, husband uh, went there. Is it oh. W-R from spelled right in R -I -R -E -I -E -I -E CARERS, C-A-R-E-R-S program. Okay. That's a great program. Yeah. Uh, aroma. Dr. Sadovoy is a psychiatrist. Thank you. There's other uh, studies. O'Connor found that aromatherapy was uh, helpful. A lot of places can't use aromatherapy because of the no scent uh, policies in certain establishments. Bed baths, relaxation, preferred music, and gentle sounds. Some of these other ones were effective as well. So that's a bit different than the other one. This is a large meta analysis of uh, 317. It came down to 14 studies, but had 586 uh, people in the study. And they found that sensory stimulation, like aromatherapy, thermal baths, hand massage, and music were helpful. They're a little different than the others. Um, this is a family caregiver intervention. And uh, looked at uh, 23 community studies and found modest effect sizes for behaviors. Effect size of 0.34 is similar to an antipsychotic. There's no side effects. So it's, it's a, again, a, a family caregiver educational intervention, sort of like the Reitman Center. Yiska Cohen Mansfield is a researcher in, in this area and came up with this, um, I guess, um, way of providing an intervention which is, again, completely non pharmacological. It's called Treatment Routes for Exploring Agitation based on unmet needs, thinking that the people with agitation had needs that were unmet. So they had the people come in with the clipboards and monitor and see what time the agitation ha happened. And so they got a sense of sort of when it was happening and started to look at what the triggers were and reviewed the person's personal history and their occupation and what they did and who they are, spoke to everybody they knew and got a real full sense of the person and put in place specific individualized plans for each person. So it wasn't a one size fits all. It wasn't we're gonna do music for everybody, okay? Or well, that doesn't necessarily always work, you know? Not everybody likes to listen to classical, and somebody else went on to listen to ACDC, Miley Cyrus, and, you know, I don't know. So, anyway, so I always digress a little. The, uh, so, so it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's, it's one of these things where they say, for this particular person, this is what, the, this is what they need, and this person needs this. And, and they had, uh, you know, things that people could use, manipulate, um, kind of like Montessori methods. Right, where, where everybody has sort of like a box, a box of things. This person likes, this person's good at tinker toys, we're gonna make them, and this person's good at art, and this person likes to play with, uh, I don't know, this, this other kind of thing that they have. So, so it's very, very spe specific to the person. Yeah? I'm just wondering, just because it pertains to my own form of research, uh, how much was the patient narrative um, part of the, the actual dialogue so it's important in terms of who the person is. Yeah. You know, part of any assessment involves speaking with the person. Now, again, the individual with dementia may not have a lot to say. Early uh, stages, of course, yeah. yeah. Right. Early you know, stages, at yeah. moderate, moderate and severe stages, certainly it's becoming more difficult. That's what's part of the assessment. So just like any clinical assessment, it's not too different than what I would do in the nursing home. Speak to the person, hear what they have to say, get whatever I can from that, but then speak to everybody else that has helpful information and look at other sources of information to get to know the person. So you put in place a treatment plan that's informed. This patient narrative is important. So they did this observation and they did two very good studies. They were both positive. So I said to the administration at Baycrest, you gotta do this, this is great. 
I said, okay, so we just need more resources. And that usually becomes the problem. Uh, who's gonna actually do the clipboard thing? Who's gonna help the person? Uh, you know, you do the sensory stimulation or do this. And that's one of the biggest problems. So, and I spoke to Dr. Yusko, Colin Mansfield, and I said, I love your thing, but like, how do you implement it? And she said, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> But we know it could work. So you know, if we do enough of these studies, maybe somebody will listen to us and throw more mo more money and resources into into the care of these people, which they have been, um, because you don't always need medication. This was not with physically aggressive people, though. Just to be clear. This may be great though if we're still at home. Oh, absolutely. That's where I would see that would be the resources and the resources. Mm -hmm. resources. But uh, you know, for people staying at home and caregivers. That may be a very excellent way to connect if they were part of that person who's good for being. Yeah, and, and with Behavioral Supports Ontario program, we have, we have um, at least for Baycrest, is coordinating the Toronto Central one portion of that. And, you know, the team is going out into residences, people's homes, and into certain nursing homes. But, and, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's hard work. You need buy in. Because it's, it takes effort, right? There's a startup process, and you need buy in. Because you know it's just not going to be a pill that's going to work here. Mm -hmm. It's it's not the cure. So. Um, and what is your website for that? Is there a website you can? You could behavioral supports Ontario. You'll okay. see all sorts of interesting things. Thanks. Yeah, all sorts of uh, materials. So another systematic review. Um, yeah, looked at forty uh, studies, looking at staff training, uh, consultation, treatment planning, exercise, recreational activities. 16 of the studies were uh, positive out of uh, the 40. Uh, but again, it just, it just shows there's a potential feasibility issue. 75% required significant resources on time commitments. It just confirms sort of what, what already you already feel when you're working in the area. So the summary is that non-pharmacological treatments can work, but there's no one-size-fits-all treatment. It, it needs to be tailored, okay? It needs to be tailored based on everything you know about the patient. I talked about ABC methods. We talked about unmet needs a little bit. I wanted to just show you what I meant by ABC. A stands for the antecedent, what happens before the behavior. The behavior could be Mr. X punched his wife. But what was the antecedent? What happens right before then? Was there a trigger or not? And is that predictable? Can we avoid this situation from happening by by removing the trigger. So A is the trigger, B is the behavior, C is the consequences. What happens after? I'll show you some examples. We look and see if there's a pattern or if it's predictable. Sometimes, unless it's documented over time, mm -hmm. someone might not actually think or see that there's a pattern. So you do some kind of charting. That This is a sort of a chart. So what you'd see here is that you put the date and time. The time of day is important. What time did behavior happen? what happened before, what the behavior was, and what the consequence was. And I'll show you some examples of that. The time of day is important because if it's always the same time of day, you start to wonder, what's going on at that time of day? There's something going on. Like, you start thinking about that. Often there's something going on if it's always the same, same time of day, not just the sundowning that people have, that, that, that uh, worsening around uh, dusk. So, behavioral techniques are are very important. I don't know, if you've had children, I like this example. So let's say you have a child, two or less, <laughs> and you put the child into their crib, go to sleep, Timmy, so you just say Timmy, go to sleep, okay, have a good night, kiss, pat on the head, it's your stuffed animal, and you go downstairs to watch Celebrity Apprentice or American Idol, whatever you like. You go, you go to do your work, whatever you're gonna do, but you hear crying from upstairs, screaming, this, that, and the other, and you say, you know, just go to sleep. Or you might go up there and, you know, tuck the child in again, kiss, go back downstairs. You start screaming and crying and whatnot and throw, throws the stuffed animal over and you hear the plunk. So you go, you go upstairs, you throw, put the stuffed animal back in the crib and you give them a little kiss and tuck them in, you know, good night. You go back downstairs, plunk, you hear it again, they throw the stuffed animal over, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How manipulated are you? <laughs> I mean, the child will understand you're reinforcing the behavior. Every time you go back upstairs, it's like giving that rat a pellet for pressing the lever in psychology mm -hmm. experiments. Mm -hmm. But you're reinforcing the behavior, right? That's exactly what, what's happening. So uh, how do you deal with that? What's the trick? Don't go up. Right, but they're gonna scream. 
from the screen. So what will happen? Eventually they'll settle themselves down. Eventually. You just have to make it through the rough patch. People hate the rough patch. Right? You have to make it through. Of course, you want to make sure they're screaming, that, that they're screaming not because they're stuck in the bars or have a fever or something like that, right? They're safe up there. Yeah, but once you've determined that they're okay, every time you go up, you reinforce the behavior. So you're going to try and use extinction by not reinforcing the behavior. The rat presses the lever and gets a pellet. What happens when the pellets stop coming? Do they continue to press the lever? No. So that's the behavioral reinforcement. This stuff works. The person with dementia, that part of the brain still works and functions to a point. Ask the psychologist, at what point does it stop working? You know, obviously, there's a point in the severity where you know, that learning is not going to work. But at, at major other points, for sure. So people will reinforce unwanted behaviors. Mr. X is in the hallway screaming in a nursing home. Okay, So what's the natural reaction of the staff? To go see what's going on, give him back the teddy bear, tuck him in, kiss on the head. It's the same thing. So, you know, there's a lack of stimulation, the person's bored, screams again. Staff go back, positive reinforcement. So what do you have to do? You have to ignore the screaming patient. Ignore the screaming person. Does it work? Yes, it does work. There's a bit of a rough patch there. You get that rough patch. And then the Ministry of Health happens to be there that day because they're doing their inspection, <laughs> just a random audit, and there's a family member, and the CEO is walking by, and, and they say, what are you doing here? You, but but th this actually works. People understand. But it has to be a team effort. Everybody has to do it. If it's intermittent reinforcement, it's just as bad as positive reinforcement. Okay. So don't reinforce unwanted behaviors. Reinforce alternate behaviors. Give the person attention when they're quiet and calm. Give them attention predictably at a certain interval. Okay? But not responding to every scream and yell. That's one patient she used to put herself on the floor. So my treatment order was let her lie on the floor. You know, they write me up in the Toronto Star maybe, but <laughs> because she was lying on the floor because she wanted attention. And the nurses can go and pick her up every two seconds. But we knew she was on the floor for that reason. She was fine. She didn't fall. She didn't break a hip. She's not hurting anybody. She's not all scratched up or anything. She's just lying there. You know, she just walk over the person. And eventually, she stopped lying on the floor because it wasn't getting her anywhere. That part of the brain was still working. Okay? And it's not mean. It's just It's the only thing you can do. You don't give a medication for that. I said that. We've had other successes. Um, putting a signs on doors, do not enter, in different languages for different, we had one person wandered into everybody's room, Medicaid and Dr. Madden, it's like, you know what, um, the staff said before that happens, because the medications have side effects, falls in particular, we're going to go for the trazodone, we just wanted to slow them down somehow, but actually when they found to put stop signs, it, it didn't work, you know, when they put it, they said stop, but when they did it in Hungarian, it did work, so we had the Hungarians decked out in Hungarian all over the nursing home, do not enter. And it worked. Okay, but low cost, easy. We had someone who was very um, understimulated but needy, needed people around all the time. And eventually we got to the point that someone said, just give her a mannequin next to. So we got a mannequin, and she sat next to the mannequin holding their hands. Worked. I don't know why it worked, but it worked. And eventually, you know, they, they just left the arm, or she held the arm, and there were body parts all over the nursing home being used to hold on. But, but she, this lady, I'm telling you, I had her like four or five different psychotropics. She went to the special behavioral unit, but it was the mannequin that helped. Um, there's this other man, 100 years old, agitated, going to everybody's room. They couldn't redirect him. You know, when you want to get someone out of a, a certain area and they don't want to, you kind of touch them and before you know it, it turns into a fight. So we ended up finding out that he liked coloring. He'd sit all day and color in a coloring book with crayons. Okay, I don't know who thought of it. Someone thought of the idea. Let's try it. It worked. No more wandering. And he was awake all day, coloring at night. He slept. Okay, I've kind of said those. I want to keep going. They might have found it if they'd had those activity pods around. Found it quicker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had one case where we had a lady who would go into everybody's room and hoard. She'd take mm -hmm. everything. This is common. Mm -hmm. And you know, dentures go missing. It's very yeah. dis distressing, actually hearing aids, all sorts of things go missing. The person wasn't hurting anybody, but collecting. Um, no, just collecting. They didn't really want to even keep this stuff. It wasn't true hoarding, it was collecting. It's a common Holocaust survivors as well. Right. So. Yeah, depending on the person's background. We had lots of collectors, so we decided we're going to make 
places for that person to collect. We're going to plant the stuff. We had these bins full of all sorts of stuff that was resealing. So let them go there and there. We know what they're taking, and we'll pick it up later. Better than taking someone else's dentures. Um, and so that worked to a certain degree. Having a good psychologist is helpful um, because it'll help you. You know, we, we've had uh, someone who go into everybody's room, so we got them trained on going to their room by training them to recognize the color. Her name was Rose, so we got our pink rose colored <laughs> um, bristle board. We scotch taped it onto her door. So, this is your room, Rose. This is your room. Over and over again. And on the other doors, we put green. So we got her to learn where her room was. Did it work all the time? No. Was it a bit better? Yes. So, and then we had the rummage bins. It was a tough, it was a tough line. So I have some cases. And I'll show you what the ABC charting looks like. So um, I won't leave time for questions. So let's say you have an 84-year-old man with Alzheimer's uh, in a nursing home, irritable, aggressive previously, and screaming, throwing things. He was a postal worker, delivered mail for most of his life, enjoyed gardening and sports. This kind of information is important in terms of who the person was and sort of what they may have liked and what they, what they drink the, uh, to, the, uh, to the situation right now. Um, nothing medical was going on right now. Moderate MMSE, so moderate sort of dementia. It's very agitated, screaming, tried to hit somebody, grabbing, wouldn't let go, kind of tug of war with that arm. If you did, and if you did the ABC charting, this is what you get. So what you see is an antecedent sitting in a recreational program, and the person was screaming and yelling, and and then removed from the activity, sat in the room and settled. Then another day, found wandering into another resident's room, told him to stop, there was a strike. Patient was sitting at a nursing station along with other residents during the handover of the nursing home. The patient hit another resident that was calling out. And then he was removed from the area, told not to hit, and settled down eventually. And this patient was brought to the concert on another occasion, began screaming, cursing, striking out, was brought to his room to settle down. So you could say, well, this guy's violent, we're going to give him Risperidone. And there's risks of this, that, and the other. But what else do you, do you, but what do you take from this? Because maybe you don't need Risperidone. What's the problem here? It's to be alone. Yeah. Overstimulation does not work for this particular person. But you'd only figure that out if you did the charting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you, look, if you look at someone who was in their home and you ask the wife, tell me what's going on, or if you go into a nursing home, you might not get the accurate data that you're looking for. You want sort of formative data, you know, that's comprehensive. So you've got to get people to start filling this out. And then you look at it. It's kind of like looking at someone's chart, looking at a, a list of blood pressures or blood sugars. Well, here's what it's been over the last while. Oh, I see a pattern here. What do you do with blood sugars? Oh, there's a pattern here. It's always low in the morning. We need to fix that insulin in the evening or at night. So this is the same thing. We figured out all we need to do is to make sure we don't overstimulate this person. At 2.30 before the changeover of staff in the nursing home, that person needs to be somewhere else. And they can't be in the hallway when there's a lot of activity and other screamers around. It's not going to work. People who are screaming or agitated. This person needs low levels. So that's an example of ABC charting. Yeah, could you have a private room? This individual? You, you, you would want room? that person to have a private room? Was or he a private? in it? Was he yeah. actually in the private yeah. room? Yeah. And did he have a history of claustrophobia? Not that I'm aware. I'm just thinking because in some cases that we saw people, especially if they were grouped close together, we always ask that question, was there a history of claustrophobia? Because they can't stand closed in, right? Yeah. So uh, I just wondered, yeah. especially with the hitting. So here's a case of somebody who uh, is repetitive, calls out all the time and urinates a lot in various places. So. Continuously asked to go to the bathroom, calls for help, pulls off the undergarment, the urinates on the floor. He's told not to do this, clean change, and whatever. But then sitting at a nursing station, asked to go to the bathroom, yells for help, PSW engages the patient, distracts, becomes, and the person becomes quieter until the personal support worker leaves, and then it starts over again. And the person's sitting alone in the corner, calls out for help repeatedly, and someone spends some time with that person, person calmed down, but then it started up later again. 
So what's the problem here? It's interesting that it's the same time of day, which is kind of telling. Probably less people around at that time as well, right? Is it charted the last time she had her, she, you know, went to the washroom? Was that charted as well? So you know what would happen with someone like this? They'd probably put them on regular uh, mm -hmm. urine routine yeah. every two hours. Yeah. And maybe check the urine. But what else is happening here? If you look at the consequences, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. every time there's there's something calling out for help. The person doesn't necessarily even urinate, okay? But there's attention. Mm -hmm. Every single time there's attention. And when you take away the attention, the person starts calling out again. So probably what you do is put the person on the toilet routine and then ignore all the calling out. You've rolled out a urinary infection, the person's being toileted. You're you're probably gonna try and use extinction in this in this situation. You would only know that by doing the turning. That's another example. Mannequin too. Sorry? You need a mannequin too. Yeah, I mean, throwing a mannequin. Sure. Well, that's a great. Or, you know, s simulated presence. Um, we're thinking about um, computer virtual uh, presence, mm -hmm. uh, computer. Mm -hmm. We've had one person that responded to a video of family members. Mm -hmm. Dad, everything's okay. We'll be there soon. Uh, don't forget to eat. <laughs> These sort of messages. We try that. When, when, again, they're better than a medication. This is a case of violence. Uh, this is a case where I don't want to get too much into it. I want to take questions. But this person is violent. You're not going to wait too long to prescribe something. So in a case where someone is violent, and this person is uh, violent during personal care, scratching, biting, spitting, kicking, screaming. The person hasn't had his teeth brushed in many months. He could go weeks without a shower. Aggressive, assaulted a nurse. Okay, you're not going to wait too long to prescribe something. I mean, mm -hmm. There's a reason now to, to probably to intervene. There's other people at risk. This person's basic needs can't be met until the person calms down. So, you know, there's a time and place for the medication. Is the point. So I have a few minutes. Uh, I think it's my fault for being late today, but um, you may have some more questions uh, about anything at all. Yeah? Just one question. <clears throat> we use the mini metro and the motors in Montreal. Do you find them useful just for your own personal viewpoint and in looking at the numbers, or how would you use them? So yes and no, depending on the context, the setting, and the person. So for someone who comes in and they're looking pretty, pretty demented from just speaking with them, they're pretty impaired. You know they're going to score very low on the MOCA. The MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Exam, is really helpful for differentiating mild cognitive impairment from normals and Alzheimer's. So, so I mean, if you have any Alzheimer's disease, you're gonna do terrible in the MOCA. And if you have MCI, you're not gonna do all that well either, but you'll do better than someone with Alzheimer's. Um, so if someone com comes in and they look pretty impaired already, I might do the MMSE, because I figure they'll probably score and I could sort of gauge that. And I'll usually throw in some ancillary tests like a clock. Um, you know, a lot of the diagnosis is made in the history. And, uh, and then if you really think that you need more refined testing to, because it's a more atypical case, or you're thinking that you know, more testing would be helpful, then you go ahead and do it. So the MOCA could be helpful. It'll pick up visual spatial problems, frontal problems, the disinhibition, and there's other tools you can use as well. But you know, people with Alzheimer's are terrible in a MOCA. Yeah. Yeah. What is the challenge? Is it resources? Is it the fact that you know everybody is individual? I mean, what is the challenge here? For so it's partly a resource issue. Yeah. Um, we know that the types of interventions, like TREAT, that yeah. Yiskim and Clemens, feel that sort of intervention, we know could be helpful. We know those non-pharmacological interventions could be helpful because we see it work. We know that some people just need lots of attention. 
and because of resources we can't implement the, our, our, these interventions. So that, that becomes a problem. Um, you also need resources, I think, to create and modify the existing structures. He left already, but the existing structures to make it more compatible with someone who has a dementia. Mm -hmm. and it's, it all costs money in the end. Mm -hmm. And we're in for it, you know, the, the rising tide as it, you know, mm -hmm. if you look at the document, mm -hmm. the stats can, mm -hmm. you know, diagnosis of dementia is going to be very, very common, and most people have behavioral symptoms. So, you know, the challenges are not working with families. Families want to work with you. Um, it's not getting consent for medications. If you do it properly at the right time, um, you know, we just, we have, we have, we have some tools to, to, to use. So I think the most rushed, and, and really what's frustrating is, uh, you know, as a clinician or a healthcare professional, when, when you can't get the person better and there's distress, and that becomes kind of contagious. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes very, you feel bad for the caregivers mm -hmm. and the family. Mm -hmm. There's always that demoralizing sort of feeling that you get. But most of the time we're able to help people. You just have to keep upgrading the, the kind of care. So these new behavioral support units are helpful. Uh, specialized units are helpful. It's transition units, just for four or five months, mm -hmm. but they're helpful. Have you any favorites for disorientation or uh, wandering uh, patients? And uh, is uh, uh, subcutaneous implants ever indicated for uh, I mean, like a GPS? Who, yes. That's interesting. Um, the wander guard is mm -hmm. uh, the favorite tool of the uh, institution. You deactivates the elevators. It mm -hmm. doesn't let the doors unlock and that sort of thing. The boomerang, um, uh, what's it called? Um, the system used by Alzheimer for Alzheimer's Society uh, back home, I forget what it's called now, I don't know why, I can't remember, but it, you know, it's that if someone gets lost and they get, mm -hmm. by that point, you know, you've done, you've done something wrong, they've gotten out and uh, wandered, it's, 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 it's frustrating when that happens, but wandering is very common, you get people, you know, people who, let's say, were active their whole lives and they just can't sit in a chair mm -hmm. and they want to wander around and explore. So you need an environment that will do that. There's no other, you know, you have to let them wander. You let the wandering person wander. Mm -hmm. Unless they're distressed and looking for something specific. But usually they're just wandering, trying the doorknobs, they go in, there's a brush, they wander, they go somewhere else. It bothers other people. But it's just a, it's sort of like a basic need that they have. So that's why it'd be good if there was a track, something that would give people exercise. If you go to a, a, if you look at what's the activity level of someone with dementia in an institution or a home, it's probably sitting, sitting, sometimes sleeping. You know, and if you're lucky, if you have a dedicated family or spouse or caregiver to take you out and do things with you, I mean, that's great. That's not for everybody. But if you look at an institution, an ideal place would have the day-night setting. Okay, you could have some wanderers uh, at night, some during the day, tracks, things to use, things to keep you busy. Virtual, you ever watch Star Trek uh, Next Generation? Yeah, these computer things, you could just say, I want to be in the Wild West, mm -hmm. and suddenly you'd be in the Wild West, of course. Mm -hmm. so imagine if you could just have a virtual environment mm -hmm. where you can just do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. and everybody have their environment. So something interesting must be uh, coming eventually. Maybe Apple will come up with something. Mm -hmm. An eye environment. Yeah. 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 I've forgotten the name of the village, but have you heard of the village in Holland that basically created the village around that yes, whole concept of that. aligned, aligned. That's, that's I mean, I know that's the nirvana, but um, the fact that, that there has been money put aside, do you happen to know any of the people who have been involved in that? Yeah, I know that. So I'm not aware of, we're, of, of anybody doing that here right now in yeah. Ontario, but that would be the right idea. Because it, 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 there's a big, it's, I've forgotten the name, but if you actually Google um, Alzheimer's Village in Holland, it will come up. Yeah, like having it, a village and, and a place where you can yeah. deal with all the different problems that come with it. And even culturally, uh, the, the piece that comes with it is culturally, um, they realize that just because you have this disease it doesn't change who you are or who your life experience is. So they would have individual houses where of people with like a similar background would be housed so that there wouldn't be an agitation raised because of the experiences that whenever there was some cognitive connection between like some of the residents, it wouldn't be an annoying thing. It would be one where they had had similar experiences or had, had something similar in their background. It was really 
but I'm sure it's very expensive. Well, you know, so who's going to put up the money? We need a billion dollars for that. I do. We need a billion dollars for that. But we're spending a billion dollars on the other end anyway. The caregiver current burnout, but they're going to emerge. They're going I mean, to emerge you know at what? alternate level of care. You know what? They get so stuck in the, in, the, in the hospital because they can't be trapped. Exactly. The hospital beds are expensive. Exactly. Yeah. So you know what? how many studies do we have to do? Like, just do it, folks, and let's see. You know, I mean, a billion dollars is a billion dollars. So, no, so the government is moving uh, in that direction. And the, the people understand yeah, the senior exactly. strategy is, is yeah. alive and well. That's right. And this behavioral supports, I mean, the government put millions of dollars into this, and that's where it needs to go. And people need, I mean, the forecast is what it is. We're going to need to look after the elderly in a way to preserve their dignity, mm -hmm. enhance quality of life in a way that's not going to bankrupt everybody, mm -hmm. uh, because that's going to be a potential problem, because we have lots of people to take care of. But some money need, probably needs to be put aside to implement innovative ways of living, like, like the village. Um, and to keep people in their homes if possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Technology. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, the, the bathroom senses that you've come in, and it, it tells mm -hmm. you how to urinate, it tells you how to flush the toilet. There's all sorts of interesting things that are out there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so thank you. Um, thank you. And sorry again for being late, but uh, next year I'll be on. I'll leave like two hours early. <laughs> <laughs>